Hello again and welcome to part two of the Australian Unemployed Workers Union's online advocacy course. This section is called Unemployed Workers' Rights and here I'm going to give you just a very brief overview of all the rights unemployed workers have within the employment services industry. And here I'm going to be cover the rights, basic rights, unemployed workers have across three different contracts which govern the entire employment services industry. And this includes Job Active, which is the biggest of all the contracts and that covers most unemployed workers. Then there's the Disability Employment Services contract, and that covers unemployed workers who have significant disabilities. And then thirdly, there's the Community Development Program, which is the system that operates in remote areas, dealing mostly with um, Indigenous unemployed workers. So what are rights? Rights are the protections and entitlements given to unemployed workers participating in the employment services industry. These protections and entitlements are listed in the, the deeds of each of these systems and also in the guidelines that the government writes to sort of summarise these deeds. This is the information that the government put up online and this is where the Australian Unemployed Workers Union does most of its work in terms of trying to discover what rights unemployed workers have under this system. One of the tricky things about understanding the rights of unemployed workers within these contracts is that there's a lot of discretion given to job agencies. So as we've found in the contracts, some rights are very, very definitive and very, very clear. And this is often um, expressed in the contracts by saying job agencies must do this, job agencies must do that. And they're the most um, clear-cut rights unemployed workers have. On the other hand, there are other rights in which it's much less clear-cut, and in the deeds and guidelines it states that job agencies should do this, or job agencies should do that. So in that case, it's up to the job agencies whether they follow that section of the deed or the guideline. And this, of course, gives job agencies enormous power in their dealings with unemployed workers because they can really pick and choose what parts of the guidelines or deed they follow. But there are some parts they can't pick and choose. There are some rights that unemployed workers have that are non-negotiable. And this is the important part of the work we do, is to inform unemployed workers about the rights they have and the services and protections that unemployed workers can only really negotiate with their job agencies for. And at these sorts of points, you start to see the limitations of the employment services system and that the contracts aren't very good contracts. They're not the sort of contracts that really offer unemployed workers a huge array of services, but there are really important ironclad rights that are listed in the contracts, which I think most unemployed workers don't know about. So let's have a look at what it's like going through the social security system or what rights you have along the way. So there are three phases, really, um, when someone is trying to access the unemployment entitlement and th the first phase is Centrelink and it's important to remember that at this point the unemployed workers union don't offer much support to unemployed workers because that support already exists there already is the national welfare rights network which a government funded group dedicated to offering advice to unemployed workers as they deal with Centrelink but it's still important for us to understand how social security works and then we can refer people to the appropriate service when they come in. So when someone wants to access Social Security, um, an unemployed person wants to access Social Security, they have to apply to Centrelink for the doll. And this is a very, very difficult phase for people. The Unemployed Workers Union has heard cases of people having to wait three months until they get on the doll. So it's a very, very difficult phase for people. And when we get those sorts of inquiries, we have to refer them on to appropriate services. Once you have made your application to Centrelink and it's accepted, you'll then um, be assessed to decide what system is, is most appropriate for you. So if you've got no barriers to work, you would be referred to the Job Active system. If you've got significant barriers to work, you would be, assessed, you would be referred to the Disability Employment Services system. On the other hand, if you're living in a remote area, um, 
under the community development program, you would be referred to that system, and that's the only system that operates in those areas. Centrelink will then place you into a job agency, and it's important to remember that this first phase where you get placed to a job agency, Centrelink actually might put you into a job agency that's not appropriate, and we've seen this happen on many occasions where people with disabilities are put into a job active agency or Centrelink puts an unemployed worker with no disabilities into the disability employment services industry. So I think when we get these sorts of concerns, we need to educate people on how this aspect of the system works. But in most cases, when we get concerns around Centrelink, we refer people on to the national welfare rights sector. By far the most common concern that we get during this phase is for unemployed workers who have been knocked back from the disability support pension and they're being forced to attend these job agencies and go through this, this referral stage. When we get these sorts of concerns, we refer them on to the National Welfare Rights Network, but we also refer them to our disability support officer who helps people try to resubmit their disability support application. So now that you've been placed into a job agency, phase two is the initial appointment with your job agency and the creation of a job plan. And here is where our work begins, trying to ensure that before people go into these appointments, they understand what their rights are. And there are a lot of rights here at this point. Um, here are a couple of um, grabs from the Job Active and DSD. And as you can see, there's, they're very similar and they have a lot of important points that need to be discussed at this, at this initial appointment. If you look at the job active um, deed on the left there, you can see that there's quite a few things that the provider must do. Um, they must explain the employment provider's services that, that they're going to give to them. They must identify the strengths and any issues that, may, that, that the unemployed worker may have relating to finding employment. They must explain their rights and obligations under the Social Security law. They must prepare an updated job plan for them. And also, they must, this is just um, the most important one to, which um, we've highlighted here, the job agency must canvass with them the jobs that employers have available in the local labour market and refer them to suitable vacancies. And that's all meant to be done in the initial appointment, which um, is quite a lot of work for the job agency, and in many cases we don't, we don't see any of that really happening in that initial appointment, aside from the creation of a job plan, which is the most important thing for the job agency in that initial appointment. Similar story with DES, um, they must uh, explain the services they have to provide, they must explain the rights and obligations that unemployed workers have under the DES system. And e even that, I mean, let's just talk about that, like the rights and obligations that unemployed workers have would take a long time to, to discuss and to explain looking at the, the deed and the guidelines, there's thousands of pages worth of important information that unemployed workers need to know when they're dealing with job agencies. So that alone would take a job agency you know, at least half an hour to, to discuss all the rights unemployed workers have. And the fact of the matter is job agencies just don't have the time to do that, let alone all the other things on the list here that job agencies are required to do for unemployed workers. And this is a contract that job agencies have signed with the Department of Employment. They've been given millions of dollars by the government in order to provide these services. If an unemployed worker gets referred to the Community Development Program, it's a quite a similar position where the job agency is required to give them information about the best ways to look for work, the job seeker aspiration, goals, community needs and opportunities, etc., etc. And there's a there's a bit of information there about what the job agency is required to do for community development program unemployed workers. Now we move on to the responsibilities job agencies have to unemployed workers and this is what of course they're meant to be explaining to unemployed workers but often we find they don't actually explain these points in these appointments. So let's go through some of these documents. First here on the left you've got the job active service guarantee and here it goes through what you can expect from your job active provider. So here the, the job active provider will, um, which is, that's a guarantee. That's not should, that this is a 
something that they have to do according to the deed. They must work with you to develop your job plan. This sets out the services you will receive and the minimum requirements you need to meet while you're on um, activity tested income support. So it's important that there's minimum requirements there. You have a right to search your minimum requirements at this point. Um, they identify your strengths and weaknesses, re refer you to suitable jobs, um, reassess your needs if your circumstances change, help you with wage subsidies, um, treat you fairly and with respect in a culturally sensitive way. The Employment Services Code of Practice is um, another document that really outlines the responsibilities job agencies have to, to unemployed workers. Um, it says here that they must ensure that their staff have the skills and experience they need to provide quality and culturally sensitive services to job seekers, employers and local communities. The job agencies must behave ethically, acting with honesty, due care and diligence, they must be open and accountable um, and they must sensitively manage any information. The, these are all rights that unemployed workers have. The, these are things that job agencies have agreed with the government to provide. Next we've got the DES um, service guarantee here and this is quite a comprehensive document. I was researching this, I was really quite uh, amazed at some of the stuff DES agencies are meant to provide, or required to provide actually. So I'll go through some of them here. They're, they're meant to, like Job Active, help you find or keep a job, but they also have to provide ongoing support once you get a job. They must treat you fairly and with respect, um, be sensitive to your individual needs when helping you, um, including any impact that your disability, health or health condition might have on your ability to find and keep a job. Um, this could also include any parenting or caring responsibilities you might have and they have to be culturally appropriate. And here are some of the, 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 the quite um, surprising aspects here that job agencies, DES agencies are required to provide. They're meant to um, work with prospective employers to match skills to your need. They're meant to provide you with help which may include training, work experience or services to help you overcome any issues that are making it difficult for you to find and keep a job. Any issues. Um, they're meant to help you access other support services you may need, um, provide you with advice on the best ways to look for work, and checking that work is suitable for your condition or injury. Moving on to the DES Services Code of Practice, we've got a lot of things similar here to the D to the sorry to the Job Active Code of Practice. Um, DES staff must must be suitably trained. They must be respectful and tailor assistance to job seekers' personal circumstances, skills, abilities, and aspirations. Moving on to the CDP um, Code of Practice and Service Guarantee. There are many similarities here that we saw in the previous two systems. Um, CDP providers, once again, must behave honestly, fairly, treat people with respect, um, respect community policies and protocols in delivering these services in a culturally sensitive way, engage with communities to identify activities that meet community priorities, um, provide and promote local employment by employing local job seekers within their organisation. So actually the job agencies are required to employ people through their own organisation. I wonder how many job agencies do that. Um, the CDP provider must also work with the unemployed worker to develop a job plan personalised to their needs and assess level of capacity that will put them on a pathway to work and updating it as their needs change. They have to be sensitive to their individual needs, tailoring assistance to job seekers with disabilities, injuries or health conditions and caring or parenting responsibilities. They're providing unemployed with professional support if you need it, counselling etc. Helping unemployed workers overcome any barriers to work, including assistance with writing your resume, job applications and job interview skills and providing advice on available work opportunities. They're also meant to provide mentoring and support following placement in employment. So you, you can sort of see here that job agencies have a lot of requirements when it comes to helping unemployed workers, both in work and when they're out of work. They're meant to support them in all sorts of facets of their life. Like this, this document is a, is a good example of that when it says here that they must 
help you overcome any barriers to work. So, and, and that's consistent throughout every contract. These are requirements of the job agencies and then all these aspects are meant to be included into the job plans of unemployed workers. So now we've gone through the requirements job agencies have to unemployed workers. Let's go through the requirements unemployed workers have across each of the three contracts. We'll start first with the job active system. Um, this is a very onerous system and also very complicated. It's broken up to three different cohorts um, based on age. So the first cohort is up to 30 years of age. And then within this cohort, unemployed workers are broken up into three different streams. So stream A is considered the most job ready, stream B moderately job ready, and stream C is the least job ready. And as you can see, the requirements vary slightly from stream to stream. But overall, there are three key requirements that unemployed workers in job active must fulfill. Firstly is job search. And that requirement is generally 20 per month for streams A and B, and for stream C it depends on capacity. It's a little sneaky how, the, how it says depends on capacity there because actually the amount of job search you're required to do always depends on capacity, streams A, B or C. The next big requirement um, is appointments, and as you can see it says that across all streams, just appointments. Um, that's a little vague as well because the amount of appointments that you're required to attend, the minimum amount of appointments you're required to attend is one. And that's stated in the in the deed and the and in the guidelines, but it just states appointments there. So those two requirements you basically have to do all the time. Job search and appointments. There's no really getting around it unless you have an exemption. The third requirement is what's known here on the graph as the work for the dull phase. And this is another really tricky aspect because even though it's called the work for the doll phase you don't actually technically have to do work for the doll so it's a it's a strange one and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail these days work the work for the doll phase begins after one year of being on the new start payment or one year of being with it with a job with the job active agency and generally the hours are, are the same it's 50 hours per fortnight over 26 weeks a total of 650 hours. But this um, changes depending on your personal circumstances. So if you're considered a primary care provider or PCP as it states here, your requirements go to 30 hours per fortnight. And the same goes for if you're considered a primary, sorry, um, having a partial capacity to work, a PCW, then you're requirements also reduce to 30 hours per fortnight and also the requirements change depending how long you've been on 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 payment as well as you can see the work for the doll phase begins after one year generally of being on new start and then it only kicks back in um, for stream um, a unemployed workers after 24 months. So you can see from stream B and C that it's just back to appointments and, and job search after that phase. So moving on to the 30 to 49 cohort, um, it's a similar situation here. The, the only thing that changes is the amount you have to do, um, about the amount of hours you have to do for for your work for the doll phase. So it's, it reduces from 50 hours to 30 hours for the standard um, requirement and it reduces further for people who are, who are single parents known as PCP or um, partial capacity to work it reduces down to 15 to 16 hours per fortnight. Um, moving on to job seekers aged between 50 and 59. The requirements here are effectively identical uh, to the previous cohort. Um, you've got appointments, you've got your, your job search. Um, the only difference here is the wording where under annual activity requirement, AAR, it, it states choice of activities. And this is quite misleading actually because 
as I was mentioning earlier, everybody has a choice of activities when they enter into their work for the doll phase, but it seems like job active agencies are more encouraged to give people choice when, when they're over 50, but the reality is everybody has that choice. So just another really tricky part of these, um, of these guidelines. Finally, we have the job seekers 60 years and over, and here it's, it's, it's really sneaky again because um, just looking at the work for the doll phase, it, it still has it there on the guide, even though um, job seekers over 60 have no annual activity requirement. They're not required to do work for the doll, but it still puts it there on, on this graph, which is really misleading. Um, and it says it right there, no AAR, but yet they still have the work for the doll phase. So it's, it's quite, um, yeah, very misleading. Um, otherwise, the, the, the only difference here, aside from not having an annual activity requirement, is that the job search is generally 10 per month. That's, that's the only real difference there. So now we'll move on to the Disability Employment Service and the DES is very different to Job Active. There, is, there are no streams and there aren't these different cohorts based on age. It's a much simpler system in that way um, and also has no annual activity requirements, so no work for the doll. You can opt to do work for the doll um, if you want, but yeah, there's no work for the doll requirement. The, the main thing here are job searches and uh, appointments. And as it states here, you're required to attend um, six contacts over each period of three months. So that's, that's, that's fortnightly appointments. And also, um, if, if you want high ongoing support, if you're deemed to need high ongoing support, then that's 12 contacts over each period of three months. But that's something that is meant to be negotiated. So yeah, to summarise there, DES, the requirements are job searches and contacts. So it's interesting that it uses the word contacts there, so you're not actually required to necessarily go into your job agency. You can do you can attend those um, meetings, if you will, over the phone. Just make contact is all that's that's necessary. And this is the same with uh, Job Active as well, where you can negotiate with the job agency to make the, the meetings over the phone. And that's something where the negotiation component of the system is, is so important. Finally, then there's the CDP requirements. And these are by far the most onerous um, of the requirements of, of any of the three systems, because you must attend work for the doll all year round and that's as you can see there it's within the 18 to 14 years old uh, eligible for work for the doll and you must attend 25 hours per week in work for the doll so the same as the job active system 50 hours per fortnight but there's no phases here it's just constantly work for the doll and as well as that you have the monthly appointments and then looking for jobs as agreed with the agency. So it's quite shocking, really, that people are expected to attend work for the doll all year round. And a clear case of discrimination against um, Indigenous Australians because the CDP is predominantly Indigenous. And it's for this reason that people in the CDP program are 70 times more likely to get cut off. Um, so now we've gone through what unemployed workers are required to, to do in order to accept the payment, and we've seen what job agencies are required to provide unemployed workers. So the next part is putting all that onto a job plan and making sure that it's considerate to the needs and circumstances of, of unemployed workers. This is a very, very fraught process, putting, putting all this onto a job plan. And we've seen time and time again that unemployed workers get forced onto job plans which 
aren't considering those elements that we just discussed. And job agencies forced unemployed workers onto job plans that aren't actually there. But according to the the deeds across all the systems, the, the job plan must consider all these elements. So let's just go through them very briefly. So under the job active system, the provider must ensure that the job plan for each stream participant contains the terms of the activities um, must must meet, contains the details of any vocational and non-vocational activities that are specifically tailored to address the, the unemployed worker's individual needs or partial capacity to work, um, and that they're designed to help unemployed workers overcome any vocational barriers and non-vocational barriers having regard to the particular employment services that they're receiving. And it's meant to be updated to include any details of, of voluntary activities that the unemployed worker may be participating in. What um, is assumed here is that the job plan is a, is a living, breathing document and it's meant to be updated at every point that the circumstances of the unemployed worker change. You can see they're designed to help them overcome any vocational or non-vocational barriers. So that's a very, very broad statement, which means that unemployed workers can go in and renegotiate their job plan at any point. Here are a few um, just extra considerations that have to be put into the job plan that, for example, may have their job search requirements reduced. And there's a whole array of reasons why someone might have their job search requirements reduced. And finally, there's a little quote here from the Job Active Deed which states that there, at a minimum, there's one, one contact each month is required. Um, and note, like, once again, the use of the word contact there for, for Job Active agencies. So you're not actually technically required to go in and have a face-to-face -face meeting. You can actually negotiate with your job agency for other ways in which to meet that requirement. Moving on to disability employment services now and it's very similar here where the job plan um, must contain terms that are specifically tailored to address the participants level of disadvantage, individual needs, barriers to employment and there's a pretty much identical list of reasons why um, your job search requirements would be reduced. Moving on to the community development program now, and once again, we can see here that job plans are required to list the basic services that the job agency should provide and consider the individual circumstances um, of each unemployed worker. One other point here that's worth mentioning is something that was recently discovered by the Unemployed Workers Union research team was that job plans must have at least one compulsory item included on them. That's true for Job Active and DES, and we weren't able to find that in the CDP information, which is very difficult to find. What that means is that it's possible for an unemployed worker to have a job plan that only has one compulsory item on it. And this is something we'll get into later when we discuss job plans in more depth, is that next to each requirement on a job plan, it states whether it's compulsory or voluntary or not. And one of the struggles that we often see is job agencies asserting that certain requirements are compulsory when they're actually voluntary. So you have the right, going by the DES and Job Active Deeds, to only have one compulsory item included on, on your job plan. So that's something that we need to be informing unemployed workers of. So now we enter into phase three. Um, just to recap, we've had phase one, which is getting on the unemployment entitlement with Centrelink. Phase two is the initial appointment with the job agency and creating a job plan, which includes all that information um, about the job agency's requirements and the unemployed workers' requirements. And now phase three is just the ongoing support that agencies must provide um, unemployed workers. And as you can see on this document, Job agencies must provide um, access to suitable vacancies, advice about the best ways to look for work, advice about local, regional, national employment opportunities, assistance as required to apply for jobs, access to free Wi-Fi facilities at each site, information about skill shortages and assistance preparing a resume where appropriate, and 
also just facilities at each um, office to to look for work and to make telephone calls and printing. Other services available, and this is where it gets um, a little more sort of a bit of a grey area where these services aren't actually things job agencies must do, but they're things they should do in, in certain circumstances, which includes giving people access to an employment fund. And the employment fund is a stash of money that every unemployed worker has, um, has attached to them. And they can essentially ask their job agency for access to that employment fund for work-related expenses. And this is, this is part of the negotiation between the unemployed worker and the job agency. And we, of course, encourage unemployed workers to negotiate strongly for access to the employment fund. And then there is the wage subsidy in which job agencies um, negotiate with employers to subsidise the wages of, of the unemployed person looking for work. Next, we have the ongoing support offered by the Disability Employment Services System. Here, the provider, um, similar to Job Active, must provide support in developing the skills of the unemployed worker that they need to find, gain, and remain in sustainable employment. So, very, very vague, but also very comprehensive. They must allow participants to address identified vocational barriers and non-vocational barriers, so hugely, once again, vague but comprehensive. Towards the bottom there we see the types of assistance which may be provided for participants. So these are things unemployed workers have to negotiate for, and there is a vast array of um, services here, including um, that the job agency would provide interventions or that would help the, um, the unemployed worker with physiotherapy, occupational therapy, pain management, psychological counselling, um, training, work hardening or physical conditioning programs. They will assist employers with job design um, and they will undertake workplace assessments and modifications. So allowing um, unemployed workers in the DES system to approach employers and then provide money that would modify the workplace in order to be um, more suitable for them. So you can, you can get an idea here of just the huge array of services that DES agencies um, could provide to unemployed workers. It's just, in this case, it's up to the unemployed worker to advocate for themselves for, for these services and there's no obligation for the job agency to provide these services. The Community Development Program um, also has an array of different services that they're required to provide to unemployed workers and it's important to remember that as there's no disability employment services in the CDP areas, the CDP covers both cohorts, both um, unemployed workers who are job ready and unemployed workers who are not job ready. So as you can see here, there's an array of um, services that they're required to provide. Um, they have access to um, the Employment Assistance Fund, which is also a fund that's available to DES unemployed workers, which is financial assistance for work-related equipment, modifications and services, and the Supported Wage System, which um, is a, a workplace relations instrument that allows unemployed workers with a disability to be paid um, a productivity-based wage. So that brings us to the end of the three phases. We've seen what it's like for unemployed workers as they get onto the unemployment entitlement and as they go through the job agency system, create a job plan, the rights they have at that point in creating that job plan and their requirements, and then finally the ongoing services that job agencies are required to provide. Now let's just try to summarise all that. So when dealing with job agencies, unemployed workers have four basic rights. Firstly, they have the right to negotiate a fair job plan. This job plan must respect their minimum mutual obligation requirements and their individual circumstances. And if the job plan doesn't do this, unemployed workers have the right to renegotiate their job plan at any time. Secondly, unemployed workers have the right to choose their own activity. Now, this only applies to job active um, unemployed workers because 
unemployed workers in the DES system, um, they have no activity requirement, so this isn't relevant to them, and unemployed workers in the community development program have the work for the doll all year round um, requirement, which means that only people deemed ineligible for work for the doll can choose a different activity. So it's much harsher in that system. But unemployed workers in the job active um, system have the right to choose their own activity, which can be voluntary work and approved study. So they are not required to attend a work for the doll activity. The third basic right that unemployed workers have when dealing with their job agency is to get their barriers to work recognised. This goes back to the right that unemployed workers have to have their personal circumstances reflected in their job plan. And this includes their medical condition, caring responsibilities and family issues. If job agencies fail to respect these factors and these personal circumstances that unemployed workers have, then Unemployed workers have two choices. They can try to get their un their job plan renegotiated or they can contact Centrelink and book in an employment services assessment for further assistance. And finally, the fourth right that unemployed workers have is to receive services from their job agency. And these are an array of services as we've, as we've seen already. These are obligations that job agencies have under their contracts to provide services. Within the employment services industry, we can see then that job plans are the central battleground between job agencies and unemployed people. The Unemployed Workers Union has seen time and time again that job agencies are bullying people into unfair job plans and they're not informing them of all their rights they have both to renegotiate their job plan and to have their personal circumstances and minimum mutual obligation requirements reflected on those job plans. Most penalties essentially come from unfair job plans. If the Unemployed Workers Union does its job and informs people of their rights to a fair job plan, the amount of penalties will reduce significantly. And that's our job. Our job is to help our members advocate for themselves. And that comes back to our golden rule of activism, which is to empower unemployed workers to help themselves.